Uh, I want to start by apologizing for, for my cold. Hopefully my uh, voice will last for the rest of this talk. Okay, my topic is climate change and the hydrological cycle. And I think we can agree that a lot of the important impacts of climate change flow through the impacts of climate change and of warming of the earth on the hydrological cycle. So that's what we want to talk about here. And it's not the easiest subject to communicate because there are some aspects of the problem that I think we uh, understand fairly well. And I want to emphasize some of those. But there are also aspects that uh, are still pretty mysterious and have a lot of uncertainty and unknowns. And one could also emphasize that complexity. And I'll give you maybe some hints of that complexity as well as, as we go on. So I'll try to provide some balance between things that we understand and things that we don't understand. Let me start with this picture, which is uh, one of the centerpieces of the projections chapter of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their fourth assessment. And it's an estimate from the world's uh, climate modeling efforts of uh, trying to s simulate what uh, we think is going to happen to the rainfall pattern over the Earth, uh, in this case by the end of the 21st century, assuming some fairly uh, typical scenario for growth of greenhouse gases over the century. This particular scenario, I think, assumes that uh, carbon dioxide will be about 700 parts per million by the end of the, of the century. And as I think Susan mentioned, uh, <coughs> rainfall is a more complicated subject than temperature itself because we expect, for reasons that I want to try to communicate here, some of those reasons are not that mysterious. We expect the rainfall to change in different ways, very different ways in different parts of the globe. In some regions, we expect rainfall to increase. In other regions, we expect it to decrease. And there are two pictures here. On the left, <coughs> Uh, it refers to, uh, these are sort of consensus, you think of this as sort of a consensus among the world's climate models. On the left is the picture for northern winter and southern summer, and on the right is the picture for northern summer and southern winter. The brown areas are projected to get drier by perhaps on the order of 20% or so, 20% reduction in rainfall by the end of the century. And the uh, blue areas are projected to get wetter. We want to talk about this pattern where we see drying in the subtropics primarily and uh, wetter conditions in subpolar regions and also in parts of the deep tropics. This is a, uh, just another picture of essentially the same thing. I don't know if the ensemble of models is exactly identical and the color scheme is different. And the upper picture is the annual mean change in precipitation. Uh, again, you see, for example, in the, over the Mediterranean, North Africa, southern, southernmost Europe, you have rather substantial drying. Southern Australia, parts of the western, uh, western North America, western U.S. Uh, in the annual mean, and I've uh, look, <coughs> provided a little close-up of uh, some of these projected, cha projected changes over North America where, see, if we lived in uh, Canada, or maybe some of us do live in Canada or Mexico, uh, the, sis the situation as far as these projections are concerned is a little clearer. It's fairly unanimous that among, uh, when you look at the output of these various climate models, these climate models, I think Susan referred to them too, they're just a, a, a way of summarizing our understanding of how the system works, and we try to uh, in place that understanding within these uh, computer simulations of the Earth's climate. And almost all these models are pretty drying in Mexico and uh, increase in rainfall in Canada. The United States is a bit intermediate in a more complicated situation. Uh, but with the season, uh, seasonal March, we also see that a lot of the drying is expected to occur in the s summer months over the United States, whereas during the winter months, there's a little bit more uh, increased area where we project increases in rainfall. So that's a rather subtle and difficult situation over the United States where a lot of the uh, quantitative issues relate to where this boundary between moistening and drying will occur in detail. 
we're not very good at details. We're sort of good at relatively big picture parts of this problem. Another number of ways of summarizing our understanding uh, of this problem, and I've sort of tried to encapsulate it in a few uh, proverbs, if you like, or just summary statements. And one is that the dry get drier and the wet get wetter. And what I mean by that precisely is what uh, the first part of my talk will be about. What do we mean by the dry getting drier? And depending on how time evolves, I may focus primarily on that first uh, topic. But another aspect that uh, we expect uh, will be important in the coming century is that a lot of the climate regimes over the earth, the subtropical dry belts and the middle latitude storm tracks are expected to expand polewards or to move polewards. So a lot of the climate regimes are expected to slowly drift towards the poles and away from the equator. And then with regard to the tropical rain belts specifically, I'll say more about these in turn. Uh, the tropics in general are a region where we have the greatest degree of uncertainty. Our ability to, our understanding of the tropics and our ability to simulate it, simulate tropic, the tropical atmosphere uh, in computer models is relatively limited compared to our ability to do the same thing in middle and higher latitudes. But there are some uh, themes that have emerged, and one is that we expect the tropical rain belts to move towards the hemisphere that warms the fastest. That's one way of seeing it. So let me uh, focus on this first topic first, and the dry getting drier and the wet getting wetter. There's a fairly uh, simple explanation for this basic pattern, and it revolves around the very basic uh, point, claim, or observation that water vapor in the atmosphere is going to be increasing as the climate warms. And that's simply a consequence of the fact that the saturation vapor pressure of water increases about 7% per degree uh, centigrade, typically, at the kind of temperatures that we're worried about near the surface of the Earth. So that's an important number to keep in mind. About for every degree of warming, the atmosphere can hold, in quotes, purists don't like that terminology, but I'll use it here. The atmosphere can hold about 7% more water vapor. Now, the atmosphere is not completely saturated, of course. We talk about relative humidity, which is a measure of the degree of saturation. So, you know, air rises and uh, water vapor condenses and it rains. And then that same air, it's lost some of its water vapor, then descends and warms due to uh, adiabatic uh, compression, and it's unsaturated at that point. So, the degree of saturation of the atmosphere is controlled by these movements of air up and down. And that's a re relatively complicated process, but it, I, th I think it's a conservative assumption to assume that these details of atmospheric circulation are not going to change that much, which means that the degree of subsaturation of the atmosphere we don't think is going to change very much. And this, is, this figure is a confirmation of that uh, assumption. Here we're talking about the total water vapor in the atmosphere, so the, vertic the integrated amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. And we have these beautiful microwave measurements from satellites, uh, which measure quite precisely the total column integrated water vapor. And that's the red line here. This is from 19, late 1980s to uh, roughly the present. I uh, hope you can see the red line. So what's the black line? The black line is an output of one of these computer models of the climate that I referred to earlier. But it's a particular version of a model of this type in which you impose the observed warming of the oceans. So you take the observed warming of the oceans and use that as a boundary condition for these models. And so these models can translate the observed warming of the planet into the increase in water vapor with, if you like, astounding precision. It's rare that you get to uh, get a model, a theory, if you like, and an observation to agree uh, so well in the climate. That's just telling us the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. This measurement is actually over the oceans. That's where the microwave measurement works. Uh, but there don't seem to be any mysteries here. It's, it's, uh, it's happening. The amount of water vapor is increasing in the atmosphere, more or less as we anticipate from our models. 
Now let's just look at a schematic of the geographical distribution, or just the distribution with latitude of the Earth's hydrological cycle, where we have evaporation in red. Don't worry about the details here. And uh, sort of a, a climatological distribution of precipitation in black. And average over the globe, these two, uh, these two equal each other. The evaporation equals the precipitation. Once you average over more than a few weeks, at least. But the two patterns are quite dissimilar. We have these subtropical dry zones, uh, minima in rainfall. We have these tropical rain belts that occur relatively close to the equator. And we have uh, mid the mid-latitude storm belts or rain belts. And so why do these two uh, pictures look different? Why does the picture of evaporation look different than the distribution of precipitation. It's because the atmosphere is transporting water vapor from, from one region to the other. So the atmosphere is taking water that evaporates in the subtropics and moving it into the tropical rain belt through, it's called the Hadley circulation primarily. And also water vapor is sort of being moved out by extratropical storms and dumped as rainfall in the mid-latitude rain belts. That water mostly evaporated in the subtropics and also into higher latitudes, the precipitation exceeds the evaporation. Most of the rainfall in subpolar and polar latitudes is not due to evaporation locally. That's all water vapor that got transported in. It's evaporated in warmer regions. So that's a, with season, these, these features just migrate. You can think of them as just following the sun. The rain belts move north and south, and they rate, uh, the tropical rain belt, if you like, uh, following the monsoonal circulation, also moves north and south. So, for example, uh, we have uh, what we often call Mediterranean climates, which are in this sort of they're at the equatorward margin of the uh, mid-latitude rain belt. Where during the summer, as the subtropics moves poleward, you get a very dry climate. Most of the rainfall occurs as the as the mid-latitude rain belt moves equatorward and gives you that. Uh, the wetter climate in Mediterranean climates. Mediterranean climates are interesting in the context of climate change because we think they're very sensitive to displacements of the mid-latitude rain belt. Most, if, most, if most of your rain is coming from the margin of that rain belt, if that rain belt is displaced equator, poleward, it can have some pretty big consequences. So here I've just taken the difference between the precipitation and evaporation. So that's the convergence or divergence of water vapor in the atmosphere that's causing the difference between these two patterns. Now what happens as the atmosphere warms? Well, it's gonna hold more water vapor, and we saw confirmation of that from that microwave satellite image earlier. Suppose, again, it's a conservative assumption. Suppose the circulation of the atmosphere doesn't change that much. It's still trying to transport water into the tropics from the subtropics. It's still trying to diffuse water from the subtropics into higher latitudes, but now there's more water. So you're just gonna enhance the convergence and divergence of water in the atmosphere. So in regions where precipitation is larger than evaporation on average, that difference is going to increase because that difference is due to convergence of water in the atmosphere, and that convergence of water is going to increase. And I think people have a relatively easy time understanding that, but it's exactly the same argument. For, for some reason, it's a little bit harder for, uh, to get this point across that the same argument works in the subtropics, that the atmosphere is going to diverge more water vapor out of the subtropics, and so the subtropics will get drier by the same argument. And that we, you know, through various kinds of analyses, and is pretty much explaining it's the zeroth order what these, why these patterns look the way they do. So what we mean by wet and dry when we say the wet are getting wetter and the dry are getting drier is that regions where, on average, precipitation exceeds evaporation, and a lot of the rainfall is coming from convergence of water through the atmosphere, those regions will get wetter because there'll be more convergence. And regions where there's a deficit of rainfall due to the fact the atmosphere is transporting water away from that region will get drier. And so that's the terminology. So subtropics get drier, middle and higher latitudes get wetter. Now, is this happening? This, I think, is the best uh, evidence that we have that this is already happening. We you say, well, can't we just look at land precipitation records? Well, those are pretty noisy, as I think we all know. There's a lot of time scales, a lot of year-to-year uh, -year variability in precipitation. 
over the land locally. Uh, if we look over the oceans, uh, we can look at uh, the salinity of the water in the ocean. This is a recent paper, just uh, came out a, f a few months ago, which looked at uh, using just all available data, salinity measurements over the ocean, at the trends in salinity over the last 50 years uh, over the world ocean, at the surface of the ocean. And uh, the top figure is sort of the sort of mean salinity distribution of the ocean. Because when you evaporate, you leave the salt behind and you make the ocean saltier. When you rain on the ocean, you make the ocean fresher. And so the distribution of precipitation minus evaporation is precisely what's shaping this salinity distribution of the ocean. And this is a remarkable pattern in many ways. A lot of oceanographers spend their careers trying to understand this. The Atlantic is much saltier than the Pacific. Why is that? Why is that true? I mean, various people in the audience could you know, give a seminar on that topic. Um, so this is an interesting picture, but if we look at the trends, the remarkable thing here is this trend is, looks very similar to the pattern itself, meaning that uh, the salty regions, which are these red areas, are getting saltier, and the uh, subpolar oceans in particular are getting fresher. And so the gradients in salinity are increasing over the ocean, basically as we'd expect from an increase in the precipitation minus evaporation pattern. Uh, now, there is, there's always a danger of oversimplifying. And when you look at this pattern more closely, uh, you start questioning your understanding of what's actually going on. And just I'll give you one example that the magnitude of these trends are just bigger by about a factor of two of what you'd expect from the uh, increase in the amount of water vapor that, that we expect to see as the climate warms. So there may be something going on here that we don't quite understand, but the pattern is basically what you'd expect from wet getting wetter and dry getting drier translates into the, the saltier parts of the ocean getting saltier and the fresher parts of the ocean getting fresher. That's what we're seeing. The ocean has the nice feature of basically integrating out and smoothing a lot of the, uh, uh, the noisy uh, rainfall distributions that you get out of the atmosphere. All right, so let me just move briefly. I can't say too much about this topic. The fact that the circulation is expected to, circulation features are expected to expand polewards. Uh, a lot of us in the field spend a lot of time trying to understand this poleward expansion. And I think it's fair to say we still don't understand it very well. And it's also not uh, observed very clearly, but it's a definite uh, feature of our climate simulations as we proceed through the next century, that there'll be a, a steady, if modest, maybe a couple degree, two or three degree shift in the uh, distribution of the, the rain belts and the, say, the dividing line between the subtropical dry zone and the wetter mid-latitude region. And as I said, that could have a big effect on Mediterranean climates. So if you look at uh, projections, this is uh, projections by mid-century of changes in runoff in the United States, uh, sort of aggregated in some major uh, river basins. And I think you can see the scale we're talking by. This is by year 2060, again, a fairly standard uh, scenario where we're talking about 10 or more percent uh, reduction in runoff in the, especially the western, uh, southwestern United States. Now, when, when people have analyzed, this is coming out of climate model projections again. And when you look at those projections, I think the big picture is that we don't expect this trend to be observable yet in any clear way when you look at data. It's only now and maybe in the next 50 years or so that this is going to emerge very clearly in observational data. That's one of the tricky things about this subject. We're talking about precursors that are small, that are just now beginning, in some cases, to emerge more or less clearly. The salinity trends are, seem to be emerging clearly over the ocean, but precipitation trends, to some extent, in many regions over land are not that clear yet. But this is what we're project And if you analyze why the models are doing this, it's a combination. It's not just the, so the dry getting drier and the wet getting dreader, wetter. It's also this poleward expansion of the uh, mid-latitude rain belts. Now, one of the complications that occurs here 
is maybe I could just go back, <coughs> for example, to this figure. Oops. I see that why is it that the Mediterranean is projected to have, and the surrounding land regions is projected to have so much more severe drying than uh, uh, so what you might think is a relatively comparable region, say California. Um, and it turns out in, in these models, it's because the tropical Pacific evolves into a more El Nino-like state. And when you have an El Nino occurring in the Pacific, you tend to get more rainfall uh, you know, in, in, this, in these regions. So that there, there are changes in the tropical Pacific that these models are projecting that are tending to cancel out some of the effect of the subtropical drying that would otherwise occur. And we're not confident at all in these changes in the Pacific and how El Nino is going to evolve in the future. So that's one of the, whenever you look at some region like the Western, Western North America, Western US, there are always some of these compli complicating features. The future of El Nino will have a lot to say about what actually happens over the Western United States and we're just not very sure about that at present. Here's something that uh, Susan Solomon has worked on a lot in the past, and uh, that if you ask where do we see a, uh, a clear trend, a poleward movement of uh, climate zones, it's in the southern hemisphere. And if you look at the wind distribution, in fact, the region of strong winds in mid-latitudes in the southern hemisphere, here I've plotted the latitude of the maximum surface westerlies, uh, westerlies wind from the west. This, the region, basically the region of storminess in the, in the southern hemisphere, the roaring 40s, if you like. Well, they've moved uh, remarkably, several degrees poleward over the uh, last uh, uh, 20 or 30 years. A lot of that movement has occurred since 1980. So what's going on there? Is that global warming? Well, it turns out that uh, thanks to Susan's work and others that we think, um, it's still a little bit controversial, but we think most of this poleward expansion is not due to, to warming. It's due to the ozone hole. And I think Susan warned us not to mix uh, in her talk. We shouldn't talk about the ozone hole and global warming in the same seminar because people tend to get them confused, but it's, it's unavoidable sometimes. It's one system. And it's one of, I think it's one of the most remarkable uh, evidences, pieces of evidence for climate change that we have in that it's primarily aerosol spray cans that have moved the, the roaring 40s two degrees latitude poleward. That's pretty amazing if you think about it. And it's a big subject of current research, exactly how this, the, the ozone hole creates a, a cooling in the polar stratosphere and changes the temperature grade, north-south temperature gradient in the stratosphere, how does that change in temperature gradient in the stratosphere influence the latitude of the mid-latitude storms in the southern hemisphere? It's still an open question, actually. Something a lot of us are working on. Uh, but we think global warming will have a similar effect and is having a similar effect, but perhaps a factor of two or three smaller than this effect of the ozone hole. So we expect the ozone hole to heal, thanks to the Montreal Protocol, uh, over the next 50 to 100 years. And so will the, uh, uh, the mid-latitude rain belt in the southern hemisphere move back equatorward as the ozone hole heals? Well, according to most models, the answer is no, because that's going to happen relatively slowly. And the greenhouse gas-induced poleward expansion is going to be happening at the same time. So a lot of models predict, in fact, that the latitude won't, won't change very much in the next 100 years. There'll be a rough cancellation between the healing of the ozone hole and the effect of warming on the poleward expansion. This kind of question is not academic. Uh, Australia gets a lot of, a lot of its agri you know, it's a semi-arid continent. A lot of its agricultural production occurs in these Mediterranean climates, and in particular in the Western Australia. Uh, I don't know what fraction of their agriculture, I think a lot of their wheat production occurs here. Uh, someone in the audience probably knows better than I do. Um, Projections of our climate models is for a rather severe drying due to global warming in uh, Western Australia. This is just an image of a vegetation index from satellites for a particular dry year uh, recently, 2006, showing anomaly in vegetation in 
southwestern Australia. If you look at a trend, sort of a typical of the kind of data sets we have to work with, in western Australia, there have been a lot of droughts and a lot of discussion of this topic. If you just Google droughts in southwestern Australia, you'll see a huge amount of um, a discussion of the topic. But it's all about this sort of, if you like, tenor, uh, I can't see very clearly there, but you know, 50 out of 350 at most reduction in uh, rainfall, which you can argue, is that statistically significant or not? Well, it's, it's more or less consistent with what our models are predicting. And they're predicting that this trend will continue. And, and if it does, that uh, has serious consequences for, uh, I'd say, the global warming. Let me take it back. I'm sorry. So if this, to the extent that this drawing is related to the uh, poleward movement of the rain belt, then a lot of it could be ozone hole related. Um, and not entirely global warming, but we expect global warming will tend to contribute to that uh, poleward expansion in the future. Australia is vulnerable to climate change. Um, I think my time is almost up, but uh, let me just mention briefly this question of tropical rain belts, and I'll use as an example the Sahel. Uh, so it's a region between the tropical rainforest and the Sahara Desert, indicated by, roughly speaking, this red triangle. This is a vegetation map, sort of the seasonal cycle of rainfall over Africa. I'm sorry. Uh, so the Sahel is uh, sensitive to the poleward movement of the tropical rain belt, the African monsoon, if you like. And if it doesn't move poleward as much, in, a, in some year, then uh, the Sahel suffers drought. I think many of us are aware that the Sahel did suffer an extraordinary drought in the 70s and 80s. It's probably the most coherent uh, large-scale change in rainfall that we have any record of over the 20th century. There's a reduction of uh, 30, 40 percent uh, and rainfall. The mid-century was relatively wet. This is actually a fairly good data set. Uh, and this, sorry about the colors here, they've been switched, but this blue region shows the, ex the spatial extent of the drying in the, the 70s and 80s. This was a catastrophic drought. Um, here's an interesting fact that I think a lot of people think that well, if you think about it at all, certainly if you look at newspapers during this, newspaper reports during this period, the drought was effectively blamed on desertification, uh, the more or less irreversible changes in the land surface that occur from overgrazing, or that sort of thing. But we're quite confident now that the, these changes in precipitation over the Sahel are reflecting changes in the ocean temperature over time. It's like just the opposite of desertification. It has nothing to do with changes in the land surface to zero order. Because we can mimic these uh, time series of rainfall in the Sahel. And this work started, with, started by a UK a meteorologist in the 1980s. It's some beautiful work. This is a recent model of ours, maybe not so recent anymore, where we can sort of match this. Uh, and the input to the model, that's, this is a match between uh, observations, which are in black, and uh, different model outputs. I won't go through the details here. But the bottom line is the model captures the distribution uh, over time of rainfall in the Sahel quite nicely. The only input into this model is the changing temperatures of the ocean. So what is it about the ocean that changes during this period? It's basically the north-south temperature gradient. Uh, this is a uh, picture from the uh, NASA uh, compilation, compilation of uh, surface temperatures. And plotted here, we're plotting the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere separately. So the northern hemisphere is in red, the southern hemisphere is in blue. And the southern hemisphere has been warming ra in a rather relatively monotonic, stately fashion over the whole century by this estimate. Whereas the northern hemisphere is mostly responsible for this rapid increase in the first half of the century, and then this cooling, and then the uh, even more rapid increase in recent decades. But the consequence of these different patterns is that in the uh, mid-century, the uh, northern hemisphere is relatively warm compared to the southern hemisphere. And then that switched in the uh, 70s 
uh, into the 80s where the, uh, the southern hemisphere is now warmer. So you think of the, the tropical rain belt as being attracted into the warmed hemisphere. You see that in the 80s, these little things have ramifications. In fact, they <laughs> pretty dramatic ramifications for the hydrologic cycle. They're just talking about a few tenths of a degree. Uh, that we're pretty sure that it's this differential warming of the two hemispheres that's actually controlling this time series of Sahel rainfall, the first approximation. And there's something else that worries us here, at least it worries me, is, and that is that the uh, most recent period hasn't recovered. It's recovered somewhat and haven't plotted the last few years here. There's been a little more recovery in the last, there have been some wet years, but it's nothing like the mid-century. And so it seems like even though the uh, differential warming here has recovered, at, you know, it's even bigger than it was in uh, the mid-century, the uh, Sahel rainfall hasn't recovered completely. And so some of us feel that there's a component of Sahel rainfall that's sens sensitive to a uniform warming of the planet. And that without that component, in fact, we don't think that we can understand what this model is doing and why it gives us such a nice fit. So we think there is some sensitivity a uniform warming of the planet will also dry out the Sahel. These are controversial topics. So if we take the same model that gives us this very nice fit to Sahel rainfall over the 20th century and ask what it does over the 21st century under different scenarios. I don't have time to go over all these lines here, but basically it's catastrophic. It's more severe than the, than the drought, the historical drought of the uh, 1970s and 80s. So this is a huge question. This is just a model projection. And so I'll just finish with this slide. So that if you look around the, uh, the world's climate models, there are about 20 groups, the substantial groups doing, uh, trying to create these projections of rainfall over the next century. And this is a pattern over Africa of regions that get wetter and get drier. And over, say, North Africa, close to the Mediterranean, if you look closely, you'll see most models are producing drying, also in South Africa. But there's not much agreement at all in tropical Africa and over the Sahel. We have a lot of work to do. We have some models that are producing catastrophic drying in the Sahel, which worries us. But we have no, uh, no consensus, and we don't quite understand what the, uh, how to distinguish between these different models observationally. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. This is a good example of how our lack of understanding of the tropical atmosphere, tropical meteorology, prevents us from making more definitive statements about how rainfall will change into the future. And, all right, I hope that helped you a little bit. Thanks. At the, at the beginning of your talk, you said something about uh, the projections um, that we were looking at at that point were based on about 700 parts per million. Uh, uh, the ones I was, sh I was showing were based yes. on that, yes. Um, can, you, can you make an equivalence for me between the parts per million and the temperature increase prediction? Mm -hmm. I think most of those models are warming globally on the order of three degrees centigrade, two to three degrees over the century. Mm, three degrees. It, all that warming is not due to CO2. These models also have other greenhouse gases in them. They also have a reduction in sulfate aerosols. But a large part of it is CO2. And um, uh, let's say two degrees warming would be uh, the minimum for those Thank models you. over the century. So in your two degrees Celsius, I'm, I'm reminded to say. <laughs> in your uh, graph of um, the uh, warming of the ocean and the uh, amount of water in the atmosphere, yep. you had uh, fluctuations in 1987 and 1997. And that, mm -hmm. I assume, is El Nino? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what is the relationship between El Nino and warming? I thought that that was sort of one of the big issues that people are worried well, about. It's just an observational fact that during an El Nino, the average temperature of the tropical oceans is warmer than it is in a non-El Nino year. So it's, El Nino is not just a shift in the temperature distribution, but you actually warm 
the tropics on average during an El Nino. And if you look in the atmosphere, there's unmistakable warming of the tropical atmosphere during an El Nino event. No, but the question is, mm -hmm. is there a feedback between El Nino and warming it of, of the oceans itself? I mean, that, that the temperature that you're now going up, mm -hmm. as these El Ninos come, if you look at the two oscillations mm -hmm. there, they get sort of more violent mm -hmm. as you go up. Right. Is that a possibility? Well, I wouldn't uh, conclude anything about this, the statistics of El Nino events from such a short record. We have much longer time series of El Nino events, and I don't think you can make a case, although there have been papers written about it, but it's very hard to make a case that the statistics of El Nino have changed. In terms of freshening of the northern and southern Atlantic and Pacific, you attributed the freshening and the increased salinity around the tropics to changes in evaporation and precipitation. Mm -hmm. How much do you think ice melt is contributing? It can certainly contribute some in the North Atlantic, but I think over this 50-year period, um, I think it's dominated pretty much uh, completely by evaporation minus precipitation. I think ice melt, well, maybe that's too strong a statement. But, uh, are you referring to Greenland, the source of, yeah. Yes, and Antarctica. Right. Um, the situation might be a little different over the last decade or so when the uh, ice melt has accelerated. Mm -hmm. But I think over this 50-year period, my guess is that so we're still looking at evaporation and precipitation. Sure. Thank you. Regarding a poleward migration of the sub subtropical and middle-latitude jets, mm -hmm. uh, you hinted rather strongly in your talk that at least the um, southern uh, middle-latitude jet is migrating poleward primarily because of ozone uh, hole yes. uh, in increase in intensity. Mm -hmm. um, am I to infer from that that still subtropical a poleward migration, uh, the, uh, a poleward migration of the subtropical jet, is uh, is due to global warming. And uh, what can you say about the northern hemisphere? I think the observations are are mixed. I don't think we have a very clear. There are claims in the literature that there have been substantial shifts in the northern hemisphere jets. Uh, I've been looking at that recently myself, and I'm not convinced. Most of those. Uh, claims are based on looking at outgoing long wave radiation where you have a signature of the subtropical dry zones in the radiation field and people look for trends and and actually a lot of th those trends are actually dominated by uh, changes over Africa. So I'm not sure what people are seeing is, is really a large scale shift. Uh, I think the situation is a little mixed yet as far as both the subtropical jets and the northern hemisphere jets with regard to your question. What's clearest is just the shift of the uh, mid-latitude storm track and, and jet in the southern hemisphere. The IPCC report uh, indicated that the greatest uh, uncertainty that they had with respect to their predictions uh, had to do with the cloud cover. Yes. Uh, and as a professor at uh, MIT, I think his name is Lindzen, who's been very critical of, of the modeling with respect to uh, the dealing with cloud cover. I wonder if you'd be uh, willing to comment on what's, mm -hmm. what's the status of our knowledge with respect to, to that particular issue. Sure. Kerry mentioned that I spent two years at Harvard when I was growing up, and uh, Dick was actually my supervisor for my postdoc at Harvard, so I know Dick very well. And you're absolutely right that cloud cover, how the Earth's cloud distribution will change as the climate evolves is, I think, our major uncertainty in quantifying the magnitude of the warming that we expect in the future. And there is a lot of uncertainty there. I don't agree with everything Dick says, but I think to the extent that when he focuses on cloud cover and the uncertainties there, I'm in agreement that there are huge uncertainties. But most of my talk, I didn't make that explicit, I don't think, is relates to the question of what happens for a given amount of warming. I didn't really talk about how the CO2 concentration translates into a given amount of warming. And 
to make that translation from CO2 or some other forcing agent into warming, you have to talk about cloud cover feedback, as well as, for example, as water vapor feedback and a number of other issues. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty there. I think it may seem paradoxical, but I think there may be more uncertainty in going from CO2 to temperature change than going from temperature change to some of these hydrological responses. Because once you assume a certain amount of temperature change, then the water vapor sort of goes with it automatically, and you get these, this pattern of wet getting wetter and dry getting drier very robustly. But the magnitude of those changes will depend on cloud feedbacks in the future. So it's interesting when we look at these salinity trends that they're actually bigger than we might expect. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're mysteries here, but, and a lot of uncertainties. Your talk is pretty serious. Oh. Is that Your a compliment? Your projections <laughs> are pretty serious, and uh, I'd like to know what you would suggest we can do about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I don't know if you're going to like my answer, but I, I'm one of those people who really tries to uh, divorce my scientific research and conclusions from questions of policy and politics and... Uh, 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 sorry, are yeah. you a grandfather? Not yet. We're... Uh, I'm thought, a grandmother. I yes. want to know what to do. Right. And I need the science behind it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think our political institutions and our society has to take the science that we're producing and make those decisions. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that I know anything more about that than the average person in the audience. I'm sorry. You mentioned that higher latitudes could get more wetter. Yes. How about higher altitudes in lower latitudes? Any prediction? The reason I'm yeah. asking is, you know, the glaciers in Himalayas. Yes. It may um, be evaporating, and there may not be any glaciers mm -hmm. left in the future. Yeah. I think uh, it's not obvious to me offhand that there would be any uh, systematic uh, effect to the extent that higher altitudes would get wetter, but uh, I think you know when you refer to something like the Himalayas and Tibet, uh, you're really talking about the monsoonal circulation. I think it may be a mistake to try to uh, answer that question in the context of these larger scale patterns. Whenever you focus on a specific specific region, whether it's the Western U.S. where El Nino is important, or Australia where the ozone hole is important, or the monsoonal circulation, things are more complicated, and uh, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty how the monsoon itself is going to respond to global warming, the bottom line. Thank you very much for your talk. Mm -hmm. um, what I miss a little bit is the uh, biodiversity and uh, uh, biodynamic in your uh, prediction. Uh, if you can tell us, for example, the disappearance of rainforest, what kind of effect mm -hmm. this might have, or, or rainforest of Africa, mm -hmm. of the Nobel Prize winner. Well, I'm not a uh, biologist by any means, but I think we're talking about changes in the hydrological cycle by the end of the century that are large enough to have significant effects on many biomes around the planet. Uh, there. Are I may have given slightly the wrong impression, or maybe I didn't, I don't know, but in the tropics, even though we're very uncertain, in many regions we don't know the sign of the effect that we expect. And I think that's true in the Amazon, as well as the Sahel, for example. But on the other hand, the, uh, if you look at the range of projections that are generated by our climate models, many of them are pretty dramatic. There are, there are some models that predict dramatic drawing of the Amazon, for example, over the... Uh, over the century, and other models produce a relatively uh, mild response over the Amazon. And so I don't know if I'm answering your question. I think uh, in the tropics especially, there's room for some pretty dramatic changes associated with movement of uh, rain belts, which will certainly have effects on vegetation and forests. Yeah.
Thank you.